I remember hearing some of the first calls to industry to stop the noise. And my first instinct was, what are we shooting the messenger here? I mean, let's look at where the roots of dissent are coming from. It's human emotion. People are angry. People are upset. People have issues and they're channeling it through these things. So you're going to blame the platforms? Hi, I'm Taylor Owen, and this is Big Tech. Welcome back to Squawk Box, everybody. We have some breaking news from Pfizer. Meg Terrell joins us right now. Meg, good morning. Good morning, Becky. This is the news that we've been waiting to hear. After nearly a year of waiting, the vaccine, or vaccines to be precise, have finally arrived. Tonight, news on a second vaccine. Moderna announcing its vaccine is nearly 95% effective. Developing a vaccine like this in less than a year might be the scientific achievement of the century. But now we face an equally epic policy challenge, which is how do we actually convince enough people to take it? Some surveys have found that in Canada, the UK, and the US, fewer than 60% of people say they'll take the COVID vaccine. But Anthony Fauci says that number needs to be between 75 and 85% in order to achieve herd immunity. If we want to put an end to this thing, that gap is going to be a big problem particularly since our information ecosystem is so fragmented and full of misinformation. Last week, I was driving with my seven-year-old, and we went through an anti-vax protest. A middle-aged guy had a sign that said, My body, my choice. Another woman warned that Bill Gates was going to inject us with microchips. My response to this scene a year ago would have been one of anger and disbelief. How can these people believe this stuff when it's so obviously, objectively false and dangerous? But Heidi Larson thinks that's exactly the wrong reaction to be having. Heidi's a celebrated anthropologist and the author of a new book called Stuck, How Vaccine Rumors Start and Why They Don't Go Away. She may be the world's leading authority on vaccine hesitancy. Heidi argues that vaccine rumors, even the most ridiculous and dangerous ones, almost always stem from legitimate concerns. Vaccines are complicated, and Heidi says they require trust in some big institutions— the government, the scientific community, and the pharmaceutical industry. If trust in even one of these is breached, you're going to have a real problem convincing people to get vaccinated. And right now, trust in all three is precarious. Trump has degraded trust in government agencies, the opioid crisis has eroded trust in big pharma, and science is under attack. And here's the thing with this particular situation. There is real ambiguity here. There are dozens of vaccines, each with different risks and potential effectiveness, all developed at breakneck speed, and some using new technologies. There is no one answer to who should take what and when. It's rare that you read something or hear something that legitimately changes your thinking. But that's exactly what happened when I read Stuck and when I spoke to Heidi. And I hope our conversation changes your thinking too. Our ability to navigate our way out of this pandemic depends on it. As always, if you enjoy this episode, please subscribe. And I'm always looking for feedback and interview ideas. You can reach me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Here's Heidi Larson. Heidi Larson, welcome to Big Tech. Um, I can't even imagine how crazy things are for you right now. So we uh, we really appreciate you being here. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so I, I actually wanted to start with the the very first words of your book, which really really struck me as sort of saying something about the place you're coming at this debate from. Uh, I was wondering if I could ask you to read the first two sentences of the book in the acknowledgments. Certainly. Um, My views have not always been welcome, as they question some of the modus operandi of the public health community and give voice to some of the uncomfortable concerns and questions expressed by the public that I feel we, as a scientific and public health community, need to hear. So you say your views haven't been welcomed. Um, What element of them hasn't been welcomed, and what's the orthodoxy that you're pushing against? Well, the one that I hear still, less than I did in the beginning, was a sentiment that if you talk about these issues, it makes them worse. Mm -hmm. In my view, 
it's all about how you talk about these issues and concerns and questions. If you approach them as more of a listening and an empathetic way and trying to understand them, I think that's very different than just putting on the screen, you know, somebody's big negative concern and and amplifying it. It's very different than the kind of approach I'm promoting. Yeah, and I I definitely want to dive into that a little bit um, in a moment. But I was wondering if we could first start with with some of your core principles that seem to flow through the the book. Um, and one is just the idea of a rumor. Yeah. You you say that a, and it, it, you often don't hear the misinformation debate and disinformation debate cast as in that way as rumors. Um, but you say that rumors have a story to tell, um, which really struck me. So first, I guess, what is a rumor? Well, a rumor by definition is a, is an unverified piece of information. I often say in my in some of my lectures on this that rumors have a bad reputation. You tend to write them off as being wrong or misinformation, but actually, it's just it's the early signal of something, and it can be become true. It can become verified and it can wither and die or it can stick even though it's not correct. Mm -hmm. And as I talk about in the book, I mean, in the basement of the World Health Organization, there are rumor archives and rumors were an incredibly important source of information during the smallpox eradication initiative. So they can be really important signals, but even in outbreak detection, I mean, around Ebola, you wanted to hear community rumors because it could take you to a new outbreak. Mm. Um, The problem is that, you know, the amount of false rumors, negative rumors is kind of flooding the landscape. So it's making the the whole rumor (laughs) issue a bit more volatile. I mean, is rumor then still a useful category or is it just too broad? So if it, if it encompasses everything from full-on disinformation and conspiracy theories promoted to cause political upheaval through to a family just trying to figure out how to deal with a vaccine. And when we're looking and when we're looking to try to how to how to push back and stop this, some of these problems, is rumor a useful frame? Or do we need to go deeper into the subcategories of parity and political division and financially motivated and, right, like all the different subclasses? I think rumors are a really useful framing because, I mean, the framework that uh, I've developed with my team that we use is looking at the triggers, what triggers a rumor, um, what amplifies it, what's the fertile ground, and what are the potential impacts, what are the risks Because we've seen that you can have two vaccine rumors, for instance, in two different settings, exactly the same rumor, and they play out totally differently. And it all has to do with the fertile ground around it. um, And some of the factors that we look at is, was there a previous concern or or issue with a vaccine? Um, Was there something else that broke trust between the public and the government? Because these help us understand, as we give advice to governments or local leaders, uh, how much they should worry about a particular rumor. So, so, what, so what does it, it, from that perspective, what does it tell you when the Bill Gates rumor about COVID being an attempt to plant microchips in people's heads? I mean, what, what does that signal about our information ecosystem? Well, to me... Oh. I I I take it as a it's much more about people's anxiety about being counted, people's anxiety about being tracked, about being watched, about being monitored, and frankly, uh, in a way, less about Bill Gates. It could be um, governments, but I think it it does reflect issues around motive. Uh, anxiety about being controlled. Publics are um, particularly marginalized ones, but also ones that are more libertarian, are more, you know, it matters more to us to have freedom and choice and we'll compromise our health for that. Which points to sort of 
the other core theme here, which seems to be trust and trust in all sorts of actors and why societies might evolve and how they view different communities and different actors with power over their lives. Um, and you write about different institutions that um, have different levels of trust at the moment. The scientific community who develops the vaccines, the business that creates them, the public health authorities that distribute them, and the governments that ultimately sanction and oversee them and govern them and hold them accountable. Um, can you just sort of run through that typology almost and and why we are increasingly distrusting all four of those, which is is pretty remarkable. It's almost a perfect storm for this problem, isn't it? Yeah, and that's one of it. It's because of those different domains and characteristics about how we get a vaccine that I think has made it so vulnerable to mm-hmm. the situation it's in. Because you know, a lot of people say, you know, why why a vaccine? Why not? soap or why not something else you know what is it with vaccines and and i really spent well years um trying to understand what is it about vaccines aside from the fact that you know it's a needle going into a healthy baby or a healthy person um that just viscerally gives you a reaction sometimes but what else? What is it? And it really, after all the listening that I've done in communities or through social media or whatever, um, these are the kind of anxieties and concerns people have. Big business is trying to make money off of us. The government is trying to count us or control us. The scientists, you know, scientists actually in that collection of people still have a bit more trust than certainly government or big business. Media is another group that Mm. interestingly these days we see less trust in like social media i think that people were less discriminating about social media in the in the honeymoon days when we were just kind of thrilled by the novelty of it um we interestingly we we do a lot of work on the canadian media environment and trust in it here and trust in traditional media still is incredibly high in canada which mm -hmm. we interesting to see how that and in government institutions. So, I mean, it's going to be very interesting, I think, to watch different countries as they roll out the vaccine, how those different trust levels in those groups play out with adoption rates. I mean, I imagine that's something that's central in your mind yeah. right now. Yeah, it. I mean, to me, it's the ultimate litmus test mm-hmm. um, at multiple trust levels because, as I say in the book, I don't think we have a misinformation problem as much as we have a relationship problem. And that the misinformation, in a sense, is kind of a symptomatic of not trusting in in any of those domains. That trust that Heidi's talking about, it's a fickle thing. So it's not hard to see how big catastrophic events like the 2008 financial crisis or the opioid epidemic may have impacted the way the public views government or big pharma. And sometimes that breach of trust is directly related to vaccines. A report out this morning describes a CIA operation right out of a spy novel. The New York Times says... At one point in her book, Heidi talks about how the CIA used a fake vaccination campaign to try and find Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. The idea was to secure a DNA sample from bin Laden or a family member. When the ruse was finally discovered, it gave credence to a wide range of conspiracy theories that the West was using vaccination as a military tool. In the next year, there were numerous murders of vaccine workers. Heidi has countless examples like this in Stuck, going all the way back to the 1800s. The distrust in this space is not new. But there is something that seems different this time around. So something that really jumped out to me was this connection, this visceral connection between this distrust and and political populism right now. Oh, Um, it's huge. (laughs) How on earth did, like, was that always the case? It It doesn't seem to me in your other examples that was really the underlying spark. But it seems to be now. So how did the, these populists decide that this was going to be their cause? Well, I think the populists saw how polarized this topic had become. And the thing that 
triggers a lot of the um, tension is often around mandates, about requirements, mm. which the original, uh, the very first anti-vaccine league in the world was in, in the UK in the 1800s. And that was totally sparked by the government putting a mandate, a requirement on the smallpox vaccine. And, you know, the smallpox vaccine, you know, there were people who said this is against God's plan. It's, you know, it, the way it intervenes. So these tensions go way back. Mm. And I think the populace um, often are the ones who side with the people who don't want the government controlling. Mm. So it's been really around these issues where there have been you know, let the people be heard. And a lot of the anti-vaccine narrative is listening to the ones who feel unheard. Have you been surprised by the political saliency of these arguments? I mean, knowing they've been around, it doesn't seem like they've actually allowed people to rise to power in the past. But now you're seeing that, right? Where this is embedded in the narrative of now governing parties. Well, I think it also reflects the hyper polarized moment in political history we're in. It's it's found a fertile ground. I mean, it's a perfect fertile ground factor. Um, and it's it's fallen right into that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's remarkable and, and kind of terrifying to see, to be honest. But, but so yeah. representative of the moment we're in, in all sorts of ways, I guess, not just yeah. about this issue. Unfortunately, with health implications. Um, right. And, and yeah, it's I, not just about principles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 that's certainly the case with the trust of the scientific community too. And and yeah. I, I wonder if um, I mean reading your description of how science communication and how we talk about science has changed um, struck me as well. I mean, you said that the personal stories and emotional testimonies have become the new landscape of evidence, with highly emotive videos trumping dry scientific press, and. Does that just go against fundamentally the scientific process, which is this highly evidentiary process and um, way of no form of knowledge production that is being sort of challenged by this new epistemology almost? Well, in a way, it gets back to the roots of evidence. I mean, evidence historically was testimony, was, you know, seeing it. Um, and in a way, we're going back there. I mean, I, we've gone, I think we've gone into such specialization that we've gotten farther and farther away from the person. I mean, the, you know, the old family doctor knew families, knew the community, had a relationship there, had time for a conversation outside of just giving you whatever drugs or vaccines you need. And we've become so process oriented and so number counting. And, and also we have so many more, uh, aside from growing population, so many more health interventions, a lot more. That's the other part. There's a lot more vaccines. So I think it's perfectly legitimate for people to have questions. But I do think that, um, you know, in the beginning, science was the great liberator from religious dogma. It allowed freedom of thinking. But now I think a lot of publics are saying, seeing uh, science as kind of the new dogma. I mean, listen to the evening news, I, well, at least here, you know, mm -hmm. it's like the science says, and it's charts and arrows and graphs. And yeah. uh, what about people? What about the people and the feelings and the emotions and the anxieties? And the, so I think, uh, you know, I, I think we've, We've got to come back to center in a way. And I think listening and engage, being open to those conversations, um, we need to get back there because the direction we're going is not helpful. Yeah, that binary is dangerous, right? When we yeah, have... it, and we have so many binaries going on right now. <laughs> That's, it's, for sure. That's for <laughs> sure. That's for sure. Kill the binaries. <laughs> so, yeah. so that, I mean, that takes us nicely, I think, to the, the platform aspect of this conversation because we can part of it is we can now see this conversation that's happening because it's happening yeah. in public in a way it wasn't before and we can your yeah. project your work monitors these conversations on social platforms um but i mean i have to say i was a bit struck in your book by where you land on the the role of platforms that correct me if i'm wrong but you seem to be making the case that 
these are fundamental human traits and understandable behaviors that have happened throughout history. But I'm wondering if you, if there's anything different about this environment right now. So when you look at the, the structure of social media platforms and the way information flows on them and what content is amplified, what kind of behavior is incentivized, do you see those structures as changing the nature of the problem? Or is it just a continuation of the same thing we've always experienced around these kinds of topics? No, I think the the platforms have dramatically altered the nature of that. I mean, I do say that, and I do believe that Facebook could shut down their whole business tomorrow and these sentiments would not go away. Hmm. Um, they'd find other platforms, they'd find other ways. I mean, I, I remember hearing some of the first calls to industry to stop the noise and and it's their responsibility and it's their fault and I've I remember my first instinct was what are we shooting the messenger here Mm. I mean let's look at where the roots of dissent are coming from it's human emotion people are angry people are upset people have issues and they're channeling it through these things so you're going to blame the platforms on the other hand I realized if it was only the messenger delivering a message that somebody else had written to somebody else, like the mailman, that's one thing. But this is different. It's like the mailman getting one thing in his bag, but he goes off and he photocopies it a million times, and then everybody gets the same one. Um, So there is absolutely a dangerous amplification risk in these platforms. And and that's why, um, and I I spend a lot of time in conversations and advising with these platforms and doing collaborative research with them on this, um, how to rein it in. Mm. Because the idea of just going and them kind of deleting just the misinformation when the worst stuff is not even explicitly misinformation. It's seeding doubt. It's seeding dissent. It's making people question. Um, And you can't take that down. You cannot delete doubt Hmm. legally, ethically, or other. So what do you make of their Facebook banning anti-vax content? Do you think that will make any difference? Well, that particular announcement was about ads, So, I mean, I think to the extent that there is something that's explicitly discouraging, something that can save people's lives, I applaud them for making a harder, because they've they've been spending a lot of time trying to know how far they can go without having, you know, others attack them for being an authoritarian censor. But I think in addition to that, at the back end, there's a lot of other murky space that has serious potential harm, but not upfront explicit harm, that at a minimum, you need to rein in how it's amplified and replicated. Yeah, I I think this speaks so well to the broader platform governance debate, for lack of a, a better term, that... And I often find that whole conversation about how governments should regulate platforms gets distracted by the individual bad thing, right? The the yeah. individual bad actor, the clearly egregious post that goes viral, the the toxic yeah. piece of content. When really what we're talking here is about incentives and structure and design of the system itself, of the the yeah. technology and above the economic model that underlies it. And so that, in my world, sort of brings me to the need for governments to change those incentives because those incentives probably aren't going to be changed by the private sector alone. Do you do you get to a similar place? Do you think that some of these, if it is things like amplification of gray content or recommending people into anti-vax groups that otherwise wouldn't be interested in it and these kind of structural problems. Do you think there's a role for government to actually change those incentives? Well, you know, it all depends what what country you're in. I mean, the U.S. is quite, you know, anti-government control. 
kind of sometimes at a fault when it comes to a pandemic, you know, and then you have other places. I mean, I've been living in Europe. It's a very different relationship with government, much more of a sense of expectation from government, a sense of entitlement that government would, of course, take care of this, you know, and I mean, the UK is a bit somewhere on an island between the two. <laughs> in many, and, many ways. <laughs> in many ways. Um, but um, yeah, uh, it's challenging and it's, you need to find a line in there. But I, I do think that I would get off the focus on misinformation because I think that's not, that's not going to deal with this problem. And and, and in, just last point on this, do you, do you in your work with the companies, do you see them making some of those more structural changes to this to address this problem? Like, where do you how do you how do you judge their response? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, they're they're definitely looking at the back end of this amplification, um, but a lot of it has had to be on more of a case to case basis with some parameters because. This is a kind of a new area. I mean, they've been dealing with it a lot with other hate and violent extremism and others. So this topic... Like anti-Semitic speech, right, has been the one they've used as their model for this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, unfortunately, relevance across these things. Um, so they have been looking at that. But it's not as straightforward as a lot of the officials. Um, uh, it's not like you flick a switch and it's going to change that way. So that, I mean, that gets to the final thing I want to talk about, which is how we're going to respond from a policy perspective to this need for people to take a vaccine in enough numbers <laughs> to make it work in the next year or two. Um, this is the dominant policy challenge of our era, right? How do you, yeah. how do you, we, we have a potential solution to this global catastrophic event and we don't or know three. if three or three or five, which is part <laughs> yes. of the problem, right? Because they're all going to yeah, have yeah. different exactly. complexities to exactly. them. So you yeah. have this potential solution, but like in Canada now, only 60 percent of people are saying they'll take the vaccine. Yeah. Um, right. So and it's lower in other places, and obviously there's lots of reasons for that. But yeah. that goes directly to your point that this is a really complicated social, political problem. Um, and I, I guess I some of the solutions you're, are very long term. <laughs> They're not how do we flick a switch, like you say, and solve this problem. So how should the policy community address this? Because they need to flick a switch, right? They can't spend 10 years changing cultural attitudes towards institutions or trust in their governments or – right? So – how do you reconcile that tension there? Or or can they? Or is that where they should be focusing their attention right now? Well, I think we couldn't have a more incredible opportunity to change that dynamic than we have with COVID. Um, if we get this right with the COVID vaccine in terms of using it as an opportunity to build trust with people, to be concerned not just about them getting a jab in their arm, as they call it here, but to actually, in the context of saying, how are you doing? You know, this has been a tough time. Um, what are some of your other health needs? Um, you know, we think the vaccine, I mean, we've got a great vaccine. This is an opportunity for you. I think we have to position it as an opportunity for people, not a requirement that, you know, and and actually, I think we need to do um, really get people to understand the gravity of COVID. I mean, as an illness, we are just in kindergarten when it comes to understanding how serious, complex, and long-term this illness is. I mean, we are just on the edge. That seems to be so important because, y y as you point out, there's this risk paradox people face with vaccines, right? That yeah. you, because they've been successful in the past, we don't see the downside risk of measles, right? So we have nothing yeah. to compare our risk against. But here we kind of do, right? We're all, in theory, seeing the risk of having COVID. So is part of it communicating that, or are we still in denial? Yeah, about that? I, absolutely. I think we need to, that needs to be part of the explanation. This is not the flu. 
This is not something that you get sick for a couple weeks or even three weeks and then you're you're done. This, you know, even for mild cases, we're seeing longer term heart conditions. We're seeing a whole multi-organ issues. We haven't gotten the whole picture at all yet. But I, I wonder if if it is such a big problem and the evidence shows that this is the solution. Do you think we should be talking about mandating it, or will that just have so much negative spillover that it's not worth doing? I mean, we've mandated vaccines for less harmful things in the past, right? Well, I think you don't move into a mandate unless you're ready to deliver. I mean, unless you really have systems in place, enough vaccines. Hmm. I think the most that you can do is... um, you know, maybe require it in certain settings. Uh, We don't have a situation where we have enough vaccine for enough people to mandate in any kind of large scale way. So I think it would have to be very setting specific, Mm. but ideally we don't have to, usually mandates are kind of a root of last option when people aren't taking it. I'd go much more with the narrative of this is an opportunity. Yeah. And so... With that in mind and knowing everything you do about the level and nature of people's skepticism and reluctance, are you, how do you how confident are you that enough people will actually take it for for this to work in a large scale way? I want to be hopeful. I want to have some optimism. And I think that right now, if we're on it, we've got time. Um, if we sit back and and don't pay attention to, you know, what's really going on, we're missing a huge opportunity. So I think we can, but we need to make a, a serious investment of time and of, of engagement um, now before we have whatever vaccine we have. And we need to talk a lot more about the platforms that these new vaccines are being made on, the different types, the different dosage, because people don't don't know they're hearing there's a, a fast race to quickly get one vaccine that's going to save the planet i mean that's kind of the headline narrative nobody is talking about why it's faster and the fact that it is faster because we have new technologies new platforms new ways of working this is not a shortcutted old process these are brand new processes and i can promise you from our work that the publics are not just going to be asking about that vaccine. They're going to want to know what's in it, how is it made, which country it was produced in. They're asking deep questions, and we need to be ready for that. Right, and 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 have good answers to it too, right? I mean, yeah. they, like we yeah. need to actually talk this through in, a, in an intelligent way, yeah. which governments and the media aren't always good at doing, right? No. <laughs> are, are there examples? You talk, last question, I guess, you, you asked a lot about, you talk a lot about, the historical analogies here, are there any precedents for this kind of communication and ways of intelligently speaking to populations about these kinds of complex scientific processes? Well, I mean, I think we've we've introduced a lot of new vaccines over the years. <laughs> um, and the ones where we waited till it was ready to start talking about have taken the longest time to get uptake. Um, the ones that we've kind of tried to get people on board earlier, you know, we've done a little bit better with, but there's no precedent for what we have now, not in the last century. Well, actually ever, because in the last pandemic of this scale, we didn't have the opportunities that we have now to rein it in with new vaccines. Thank, thanks to science. <laughs> Thanks to science. (laughs) Well, on on that somewhat hopeful note, um, (laughs) thank you so, so much for this conversation um, and really good luck with all your work. It's uh, awe-inspiring. Thanks. Appreciate it. That was my conversation with Heidi Larson. I'd love to hear what you thought of the interview. You can reach me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Big Tech is presented by the Center for International Governance Innovation and produced by Antica Productions. 
please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We release new episodes on Thursdays every other week.